Can you imagine how much time it must have taken to plan and then build something like this jet here? Well, our next interview is one of the top home builders in the United States. His craftsmanship and attention to detail are a wonderful thing to behold. Here's Dwayne Life of Wichita, Kansas. A little bit of my background, I've uh, been around airplanes most of my life. Uh, always dreamed of airplanes all my life and that's it. Kind of a standing joke in my family, I learned to say airplane before I learned how to say mom and dad. So you can see it's, it's always been in my blood. Uh, I've been with the EAA since I've lost track of time, back in the 70s is when I joined. I was in on the ultralight movement uh, right at the beginning and built my first ultralight and started flying it in 82. And I've been flying ultralights ever since. Uh, I've built three of them. I also, before I got into this movement, I worked at, uh, at a strip with a friend of mine rebuilding airplanes. We did annuals, uh, rebuild, cover, paint, you name it. For 10 years, I worked steady with him. I worked nights for the city and I worked days on airplanes. So, got to be long days. And then I've worked off and on probably another five years with him. And then I just said, you know, this is ridiculous working on everybody else's airplanes. I want to have something for my own. So that's what I started building these and I've stayed with it ever since. Uh, right now we're going to talk about engine oils and fuel mixtures. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how important this is. Uh, after you've flown these things for a few hours and, and worked with two-cycle engine, you'll understand it's very important. Now, one of the things that uh, I think is highly important, and the manufacturer says 50 to 1, mix it 50 to 1. Uh, of course, some of the other engines be 40 to 1, but whatever their mix is, stick with the manufacturer. Uh, you'll buy different oils and it'll say 100 to 1, or you mix this and that, but stick what the manufacturer says. He knows what he's doing. Don't argue with him. Now, as far as oils, uh, there's all kind of brands on the market. Uh, as long as you stick with the name brand, it's fine. I've tried them all. I haven't had any problems, but Stick with something that's really uh, a good uh, air cool two cycle oil. Stay away from your motorboat oils and stuff and things like that because those are designed for liquid cool engines and we're running air cool. So stick with a good air cool oil and you won't have any problems. Now, when I talked about the mix, I'm just going to kind of show you. I just happen to have a certain brand in my pocket here and I'm not going to show you, but on the brand it says 50 to 1 mix, 3 ounces to the gallon. And if you'll pick up different ones of these, you'll notice it'll say so much on there. If you go down and follow them through, they're not right. Uh, three ounces a gallon on this, more, normally we mix up about five gallons. I do, and I think most of my friends do five gallons at a time. The 50 to 1 mix is 12.8 ounces. That's 50 to 1. Well, if you mix this up, three ounces a gallon, that's 15 ounces, and that'll come out about 43 to 1. So you end up with a little bit too much oil in your mix. A lot of guys say, this isn't going to hurt anything, but on a two-stroke, it does. And you get too much oil in there, you'll end up with carbon. And this is the one thing we don't have, because it'll do this. Another thing, when you go down like that, you add more oil, you're actually going to a leaner mixture, because the same amount's going in, you're going in less gas, more oil, oil burns hot, and just a multitude of things can happen to you. So stick with 50 to 1. Use a, a ratio right or a graduated cylinder. And of course, I'm kind of fanatic on this because I worked 30 years in the lab where we had to measure everything accurately. And as far as I'm concerned, mix your fuel just like you're baking a cake or something else. Do it right, guys, and then you won't have any problems. Okay, now we're going to show different ways of fueling an airplane. We can use this method here where you can pump up pressure and put it into your airplane or you can use the old gravity feed like a lot of fellas will use. We get the gravity feed, I'm going to show you something here I think works pretty unique, but right now we'll just explain this. This is set up here where you can pump up your pressure right over here. You just get one of these pumps and you can pump it up. Pump it up and up and open this valve. Of course have this in your tank and you'll also notice I have a filter on here. Uh, all my gas I buy from the station, I run through a fine filter to begin with, this fine screen. And you'd be surprised what you'll get in there on that. But, once it goes in the container, I filter it again for whatever goes in the airplane. And then after it gets in the airplane, it goes through another filter for whatever gets the carburetor. I believe in clean fuel. I, <laughs> excuse me, it doesn't take much for, to shoot you down, so you want clean fuel, and that's what I do. Now, another thing on this, 
when you pump this up, when you get through, be sure and take this off. I leave the valve core out of there. Because what can happen, this can build up pressure. I saw this actually happen once where a fellow had this full of fuel, and on a hot summer day, this barrel actually just all pooched up top and bottom. Lucky it didn't blow up. So from then on out, I've always left the valve core out. And then the pump here will pump up enough pressure and hold it. Then when you get through, I've got a little piece of fuel tubing here. Just stick it down over that. And then if that builds up enough pressure where it's going to start trouble, it'll blow that off. And then you won't have the problem. Now another thing, if you use this type of container, be sure and shut this valve off. If you leave that open, it heats, it'll build up pressure. Next thing you know, you run uh, gas all over the hangar floor. So be very careful if you use this. It's really good for fueling, but there's things you have to look out for. Okay, we're going to show another method of filling your aircraft, filling it up with fuel. This particular airplane, as you can see, the fuel is right here. There's no way you can see the tank. You have no idea where you're at, and you have a tendency to run it over. And that can get on your paint, mess it up, give you a lot of trouble. Who wants raw fuel all over his aircraft? So what I've done, I've come up and made a special filler system for this that works real neat. And I'll try to explain this. What this is, this is a cap that goes on in place of that. And you can see the fuel is added right here. This is a vent, and it's an overflow vent. This tube here, you can put in whatever length you want. In other words, you can put it down a ways, you can bring it up, you can adjust the level on your tank, and when you get through, it'll always stop at that level. This is set up right at the bottom of the neck of fuel on mine. The neck sticks down in there quite a ways, and I've set this up where it just cuts off right at the neck. So we'll insert this, and we'll show you how this works. This has to be sealed in there where there's no leak around this or anything. So we have this sealed, and then we go to an overflow like this. What I've got is a bottle here with another vent, so this is going to vent clear down through this, and when it fills up, it'll run over into this, and you'll know it's full. Another good idea on this, I think it's great, because a lot of people do not want gas killing their grass on the field. And when you get through anything that spills, is going to be caught right here, and you put it right back in your container. So we'll fill this up, and we'll show you how it works. Now what we're going to do is put this right on this filler right here, I'm going to pick this up, and it's going to gravity feed right into the tank. And when this gets full, it'll run over on this overflow, and we'll know it's full. Okay, there we are. It's running over. Now we'll lower this. And see, this This will pull right back out of here now. There we go. Now we've got an empty line here. Otherwise, if you left it up high, you'd have this line full. You take it off, you'd have gas all over the place. So we'll do it like that. You can see what little bit we ran over was all caught right here. That didn't go on the ground, didn't kill any grass, didn't cause any fire hazard or nothing. Now we'll remove this. Right now I'm going to put that back on there. Okay, now we'll remove this. And the tank will be completely full to this point right here. And you'll never run that tank over, I don't care what you do. Now the only thing about this is, if you're going to fill this tank all the way up and sit out here for a couple hours on a hot day, you're going to get in trouble. So you should have this a little bit longer. So this is set up where I can fill it up and go fly right away if I'm going to go cross country or something. So remember that, do not fill the tank, let it sit out there in the sun. Or leave this a little bit longer and allow a little bit more room for expansion. Okay, now we'll put our cap and fuel gauge back in. If you notice, this is just like a J3 Cub gauge. There we are. We're completely full. We're ready to go flying. Okay, as we put this up, this is the tubing we're going to take with us. Now, what to do on that, I have a piece of aluminum tube that this will fit right inside of. There's two reasons for this. You can put this in here, and any time you know, we use tubing, it'll swell on you. But by sticking it back inside of this, it'll keep it compressed, and the next time it'll be just like new tubing, plus the fact that it's sealed. And any gas fumes that might be in there, you're not going to smell them. It's all sealed up. There's very little weight there, so when you get ready to go someplace cross country, you take this, you take this, and you take this. 
And we're not talking about any weight there at all, guys, and that takes, takes care of everything as far as refueling and running any fuel over. Okay, we moved over here to Macomb where you can get a better view on some of these different things we're going to talk about out in the open. The other airplane is cowled up and we couldn't see it, so what I'm going to talk about here we can see and I can explain it to you. First thing I'm going to tell you, if you have this particular fuel pump on your airplane, trash it, junk it, throw it, get rid of it. Don't even have the thing around. Uh, these little old pumps, they're fine for a while and, and they're, they're just nothing but trouble. I'll tell you a little thing that happened on this Cobe. I was flying it, took off, climbed out, all of a sudden the engine just shut down like I turned the switch off. I panicked and headed back feeling and landed and all of a sudden I'm sitting there and the engine's idle and it's still running. I thought, well that thing shut down, this is ridiculous. I got out and checked everything, couldn't find anything. Fired up again, took off, climbed out about three or four hundred foot, quit again. Hit the throttle, nothing's happened. I come down to land, it's sitting there idling again. So I said, that's it, gonna think about this a little bit. So I went back to the hangar, put the airplane up and got thinking. And it had to be fuel. It was just fuel starvation. And it's all one of these little old pumps right here. And another thing, I was using the plastic line on the suction side. And I noticed when it ran, there'd be a few bubbles come up on it. So, two things. Trash that pump, go to the dual pump, and if you notice, all on the suction side of mine, it's neoprene fuel line. Now what you do, you go to the motorcycle shop, and you talk to the guys who run the dirt bikes and on the two-strokers, say, I want some two-cycle line, fuel line. And this is what they'll give you. It might cost you a buck and a half a foot, but what the heck, it, it's going to, when it goes on here, guys, it's not going to draw air anyplace. I mean, it goes on there, and when you pull it off, it's hard to get off. So everything clear down through the tank all the way up on the suction side is this type fuel line. Now if you notice on the pressure side, this is a clear line. I had a piece here when I put this on, it's rubber, it doesn't make that much difference. But if you want clear line, a urethane line, use it on the pressure side where you can see fuel going. Now what you do on the dual pump, you go into a, a T or a Y, and then go into the single line right into your carburetor. Hook both of these lines up, but you want to run one carburetor, and this pump is so superior to this pump, and you're not spending maybe five bucks more for the pump. It's worth it. Also, if you notice, the pump is not mounted on the engine. I've got it mounted clear down here, away from the heat. And uh, it just, I've never had any problems since I've done this. Now, another thing you might notice, I've done this for years. Uh, the hose clamps, I use safety wire. I've had no problems at all. I don't like these other clamps. A lot of times, if you pinch them down, they'll get a little pucker spot in them, and that's where you start sucking air. But if you go to this safety wire, double it, twist it up four or five times, snip it off where it's about a quarter of an inch, and bend it over, pull it up just enough where it's starting to compress the hose. Now, don't pull it down too tight, or you can cut it. Especially on your thing, you'll just cut right through it. Pull it down where you can see it compressing, and it's tight, and on this line, it'll, it'll never pull off. I mean, it's on there. Next time, just snip it off, you replace them, Everybody has safety wire around. It makes a good clamp. Another thing, uh, there's been some controversy over this particular fuel filter right here. I've never had any problem with that filter. It's been on there for several years, but it all goes back to this pump. I have to admit, if you take one of these filters and one of the others and you blow through them, it takes a little more pressure on one of these because it's a fine mesh filter. But these pumps will handle this without any problem. So I can't see where a guy would have any problem at all using this filter with this pump, but don't use it with this pump. Okay, if you notice, I have this prime bulb in my hand. That's the only place that's good for is in my hand as far as I'm concerned. You can see the fuel lines are cut off. I never use a prime bulb at all. These have a tendency to deteriorate, crack, they'll draw air, and then they get deteriorating on the inside and you'll have fine little old rubber particles coming up, plugging up your filter. And if you don't pick up the proper one, you can buy one and the, and the check valves in here are too big. Well, that, if you got that little pump I was telling you to trash, you won't pick them up, and it'll get yourself in all kind of trouble. So eliminate that real quick. Now I'll show you how you get around this. I'll show you how you prime the engine without the bulb. You take this little pump, 
You pick this up over at your friendly tire store. They've always got plenty of old inner tubes around they're going to throw away. So go in and ask for an old inner tube and just cut that valve out of it. Now what you'll do, you take your pump, stick this on here, and there we are. You reach inside here and put that down over your fuel vent. And then you can start pumping this. And as you pump it, you'll watch the fuel come up in the filter, come up in here, it'll go up the line, and it'll fill the bowl. Then you're primed all the way through. And you can tell, keep, keep pumping on that, you'll build up pressure and it'll fill all this up, the whole system. You've eliminated the bulb, you've eliminated a lot of problems, and the minute you get ready to go fly, the pump takes care of it anyway. And then as you go back, out someplace and you're gone a couple of days or so, you got enough gas up in here where it'll still start. So this drains down, you'll still have gas in the bowl. Now let me show you how you can prime this on a cold start. So everything is full, ready to go, and it works a lot better than just using a choke. You can pull your vent line apart. If you notice, I have some brass tubing in here with some holes drilled in it. Pull that apart pinch this shut, and blow on this side. You can hear the gas in there, and when that gurgles, what that's doing is giving a shot of raw fuel into the manifold. And you'll find out your airplane will start a lot quicker than using the choke. So this airplane here had set for several months. I filled it up, primed everything, gave it a shot in here, pulled the pop through a couple times, went in and pulled it first time, fired right up. Now if I'd been on the choke, I'd probably pulled it eight or nine times. But if you use this method, well, you can get to it. Now, of course, like on one over here's cowled in, you, you can't get to it on that engine, but I have a self-primer on that where you can just push it and it'll give it a shot of fuel. This does the same thing. You're just blowing in it, builds up pressure, and gives a shot of fuel into the manifold, and you're ready to go. And you'd be surprised, guys, how much quicker that airplane will start doing that. Try it sometime. We're going to use the Reliant again, and what we've got on this is an in-air mixture control. Uh, it's from Arctic Sparrow up in Alaska. Uh, Mike worked on this for a long time, a number of years perfecting it, and you've read articles on him in the different magazines. And I tell you guys, I wouldn't fly without it. Uh, if you know, when you fly, the biggest problem we usually have is in mid-range. Uh, either the engine's too lean or it's too rich, or we'll get into situations where uh, temperature change. You start out in the morning, it's cold, you jet out for that, then it gets hot in the afternoon, then you're too rich again, you know, and we're always having a mess with this. Well, he has eliminated this completely with this in-air mixture. And what it is, it, it goes down and ties into your needle on the slide. Where we used to take the clips out and move the needle up and down, what you do on this, you just twist this in and out. Uh, right here's where the control is. And as you move the throttle, open it up, this pops out because it's, it's tied right into the slide. You can see how it works. So you want to get it someplace you're not going to get hung up on it. Each revolution on this is equivalent to one notch on your needle. It, uh, you start up full rich, and the engine's sitting there four cycling it or running rich. And what I do, I let mine, as it starts up, I'll turn this down maybe two notches lean in because we were full rich and it's still running rich and I go down two. And I let it run until the cylinder head temperature comes up to 200 degrees. Then it comes up to 200 degrees. I'll set the brakes on the engine, go up to 4,000 RPM, and then you'll start turning this down. Watch your temperature come up on your exhaust. You've got to have a cylinder head and you've got to have an exhaust a temperature gauge or you're going to be in deep trouble. So have that in there. So as the temperature starts coming up on this, watch your tack. When you reach the point where you're leaning it out and the tack starts to drop back and you see the temperature go up, go back rich, you know where you're at. And I'll back off rich and I'll see the temperature go down and the tack just drop a hair, then I'll know I've gone too far and I'll go back another notch in. You get onto this, you can play back and forth to where you get it. So set it right at 4,000 RPM and that'll pretty well get you in the range. Now providing your uh, main jet, is the right size and everything else, you shouldn't have any problems. So you can take off, 
watch your temperatures, and normally I can fly sometimes and never have to touch it again. If I ever have to do anything at all, it's when the engine warms up, I might go down one more turn leaner, and that's all I have to do. But the point I'm trying to make is, you don't have to worry about it. Every time the weather changes on you, it's landing and putting in another jet. I got so tired of changing jets all the time. Just eliminated all that. Now what I did, I went to one step richer on the main jet on this particular engine here, and that way I've been able to use that summer and winter. The winter I can ration it up and pour the fuel to it if I need to, and summer just screw it down, takes care of it. So that's what I've done. It's gone one uh, jet uh, richer on the main jet or the mid range, and I've had absolutely no problems. Tell you guys, I would not be without it. Really sold on it. Been flying these things for years, and this is the best thing that's ever come down the pike. So I suggest all of you put them on your airplane and quit going out there changing jets. What we're going to get into now is checking over on the fire starter because we can see everything out in the open on it where you have radio noise. And I'll go through some of the procedure what I did on the fire star to eliminate radio noise because most of us guys here all have CB radios. Some of them have aircraft, but uh, most of us all have a CB. And what I did here, if I had to do over, I'd do it backwards. I'm going to tell you what I did, then I'm going to tell you what I'd do the next time around. What I did the first time, I put the shielding on the wire. This is the shielding I put on here, on both wires, and you can see the ground wires is grounded to the shielding on both of them, then it's grounded to the engine. And uh, went out and flew it. I had all kind of noise in the thing yet. I even went to the metal shielded plug connectors. They have a uh, thousand ohm resistance in it, and that didn't do any good. I went back to the originals that came with the airplane, 5,000 ohm resistance, and that helped quite a bit. And the thing that really put the icing on the cake when I went to a resistor plug, and that knocked everything out. So what I suggest for you did anything, just put the resistor plugs in and work back to the opposite of what I did. Stay with these connectors that come with the airplane, 5,000 ohm resistance, and I think you'll find out, maybe you won't have to shield these, maybe you won't have to ground these, but if you do, just work at it backwards from what I did, and I think you'll have good luck on it. I've had absolutely no radio noise at all. Now another thing I do, I do not use the charging system. What I do, I have my little individual battery pack made up out of NICAD. You can see I've taped it all up myself and made it. These, this battery pack here, I've been using since 1988. It's still good. And I've charged and discharged that thing and flown many hours with it. So I don't see where a guy can go wrong. And the only thing I'm running off of that is my CB radio and the smoke systems tied in on that. And this is a 1200 milliampere battery pack out of C cells. By using that and not running off the charge system, you eliminate any possibility of any noise there. Now on the Reliant over there, I've got the same battery pack. It's identical in size except it's 16 milliampere batteries. And on that battery over there, I'm running the radio, I'm running the smoke system, I'm running the uh, GPS, and I'm also running a strobe. All that off a little NICAD battery pack. When you go out and fly all day and, and you just don't have any problems, come home and charge it back up again every so often while I discharge them down a ways and charge them back up, and you've eliminated any noise in the charging system. Of course, a lot of guys say, I don't like to mess with it. Well, I flew radio control for years, and we always had to charge up batteries before we went out, so this is just second nature in me to go charge the batteries so I'll go fly, so it's no problem. So anyway, if you'll do this, I think you'll eliminate all noise you'll have in your radio. So give it a try, guys. It's worked for me. One thing we're going to point out here is the ignition coils. Now, this is the old ignition engine, not the CDI. I had read a number of years ago where snowmobiles were having failures on their coils after about five years of service. Well, they got looking back on them, and most of them had run about 300 hours. So I'd read this article that said, maybe a good idea to change your coils out at 300 hours. Well, I know guys have run them for years and never had any problems, so I'm flying along, you know. I thought, no big deal, we'll see what happened. I had about 300 hours on this particular aircraft. I'd get out 45 minutes. Now, you know in 45 minutes, you'd be quite away from your home field. In 45 minutes, right on the money, this thing would start running rough. You couldn't figure out what it was. 
It just run. The more you flew it, the rougher it got. Go down and land, shoot the breeze with somebody for 30 minutes, take off, it'd be fine. 45 minutes, it started again. Just right on the money. I'd gone through, I'd checked everything, I'd changed plugs, I went through the ignition, just everything you can do, still do it. And all of a sudden, I remembered this article about 300 hours in the snowmobiles. So I ordered new coils, and while I was at it, I said, hey, let's replace the points condensers. I just went, put it all in there. So we knew it was something in the ignition that was breaking down. Never had any trouble since. So it's, it's something you, to think about. You got 300 hours. Of course, they can go out at any time. 300 hours not chiseled in stone, but it's just something to think about. If you got quite a few hours on it and it starts running rough, you've done everything you can do. Change out the coils. They don't cost that much. It's better than walking home. Okay, another thing I want to point out is when you do change out your ignition points back here in the magneto, when you pull this flywheel off, whatever you do guys, just don't lay it down. Be careful where you lay that. That has some of the strongest magnets in there you ever did see. If there's any metallic metal particles around there, just sucked right to it. And anything uh, that'll get in there like that, you think you can wipe them all out and they'll be so fine you won't see them. I had a friend of mine that He'd put in new points in his, and he'd laid the flywheel down and picked up some metallic shavings, and he didn't realize it. He'd go fly the airplane. He might fly three or four days, and it'd run fine. And all of a sudden, he called me, so I went down again. And we checked everything, couldn't figure it out, and I finally asked him, I said, well, did you lay this flywheel down, pick up any shavings or anything? He said, well, he said, I laid it down over here, and I said, let's pull it off and take a look. Pull it off and got the magnifying glass, and you could just see little fine metal particles all through it. Well, what happens on that, you can fly this, and eventually maybe one of these will fly off, and all you've got to do is get it in and bridge across your points or someplace to short it out, and down you go. Crank a few th through a few times, maybe it'll drop out. You don't know, it'll start up and it'll run again. So be careful when you pull those flywheels off. Don't just lay them down and let them get full of dirt. Okay, we're going to show you something here you can do. I know any of you who fly these has experienced problems with a draggy throttle. Uh, for instance, like this on this particular airplane, if you change this angle here, this loop, you can't even operate this throttle. It'll fool you. Even the well lubricated throttle, you have to get this loop just right on the, on the Firestar. I don't have the problem on the other airplane, but I do on this particular one. But, you know, a lot of times you go out and fly and, and you think, boy, this thing is just draggy and it's terrible. And, and I've had guys actually, they get binding so bad, it actually just pull the end off of them. I had a friend of mine who had a forced landing that way. So it's hard to lubricate these cables once they're in there. But I found out something that went back to the old motorcycle days. It works pretty good. If you remove the cable from the carburetor, and of course, this will come out with the cable in the housing. All you have to do is take it and slide it right up on the cable and slide this tubing right over the housing and start pumping this. Get somebody to operate the throttle on the other end or if you're by yourself you can pump it up quite a bit and go down there and operate it but keep working this till the oil actually drips out of the other end. Well then you know you really got this lubricated. Now don't be mad at yourself for a week now you better put a paper towel under that because it'll drip for several days but who cares about that you know you got the thing lubricated and once that quits dripping you've got that lubricated for a long time so Believe me, guys, try this, and I think you'll like it. This is a little jewel right here. I've had guys laugh about, what's that jar doing sitting up there? Oh, it actually is a jar. That's off an airbrush. Now, what we have inside there is two little uh, tubes in there, builds up the strobe. I had a friend of mine that built this for me. The little tubes, both of them are from Radio Shack. The lid is epoxied in there, so you can unscrew this, still get the electronics, but this is all riveted in, set in there just solid as a rock, and it just works perfect. And the wire is all routed right down through the leading edge tubing right on the fin. It goes right into the electronics inside the fuselage. And actually, it doesn't weigh much more than a large RC servo. There's no weight there, it doesn't draw any current. So you can see, I'm running a strobe, I'm running a GPS, I'm running a radio, I'm running a smoke system, all this on that NICAD battery pack. So you can see, this does not draw hardly any current. Legally, you can see it from 30 minutes before sunrise, clear up to 30 minutes after sunset. 
And the beautiful thing about it, he only had $30 in parts built it. Now think about that, guys. That's great compared to what you have to pay for a regular strobe. Now you're wondering what I'm standing here with this thing in my hand for. That is a good old California duster. And my son got me that for Christmas here a couple years ago, and I thought, what in the world do I want with that thing? I tell you guys, that's the best thing you ever did. You can come out here, and I don't care how good a hanger you have, the wind blows in Kansas, and you've always got dust on your airplane. You can wipe it off two or three minutes with that, and then the dirtier it gets, the better it gets, and I believe this. I thought these guys were pulling my leg. I saw a kid in the car lot the other day going down a whole line of cars, and that thing was just filthy, and it was just cleaning those cars up great. So go down to your local Kmart or your discount house, 10 bucks, buy your duster. Clean up your airplane. Now there was some real hangar talk from a real craftsman, Dwayne Life of Wichita, Kansas. 